Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and as anyone who is familiar with my content will know, what I typically do is I typically look at a video and explain why things in the video are wrong. Now one of the things that shouldn't be a surprise is that YouTube videos, or videos anywhere on the internet, are not the only places that you can find just really wacky and bad claims. Now one of the places where you'd least expect to find these wacky, out there, unscientific claims are in these things called scientific journals. However, the peer review protest, prote the peer review process does often have things fall through the cracks. Not only that, but you've got these things called predatory journals that will basically publish anything as long as you pay them. Because of this, I've decided to start a new series where I go over some of the absolute worst scientific articles or papers that I can find. And there are some papers that I do intend to go over that would make you wonder how on earth it actually managed to get published. But as for today, I want to take a look at the paper that actually gave me the idea to do the series. It is a paper called The Aether and the Electric Sea, The Link Between Gravity and Electromagnetism. And it was published in the General Science Journal, an absolutely great place to publish your papers. It's so great, in fact, that this journal will probably be popping up time and time again throughout the series. And I hope people have caught on by my use of sarcasm there that this is not a journal that you should be taking seriously. It is actually a predatory journal where you can just chuck money at them and they will publish your paper. So let's start by going through the abstract of this paper, shall we? Abstract. The aether alone cannot explain electromagnetism. In order to explain electromagnetism, we need to have a sea of tiny aether vortices. And in order to have a sea of tiny aether vortices, we need to have sources and sinks in the aether. These sources and sinks are what we call particles. And it is a dense electric sea of positive source and negative sink particles that causes the fundamental ethereal based forces to manifest themselves in the particular guise of electromagnetism. This paper aims to clarify the hydrodynamical relationship between the aether and the electric sea, and how the agency of the latter can reverse a mutually attractive gravitational electrostatic force into a mutually repulsive electrostatic force. So this paper either ignores or doesn't understand the fact that the aether is not an idea that is used anymore. It was thrown out long ago because it was just shown to not exist. The example that everyone knows of is Michelson-Morley, an experiment that attempted to demonstrate aether drag, but that didn't show any evidence of the aether. I also like how this paper is inventing a new term, electric C. I wonder how long it is before all the electric universe nutters starts talking about this electric C. And I sure hope this paper provides, you know, evidence for this electric sea. Actually, I wonder if it will provide any evidence at all, because that's generally what you're meant to do in papers. So the next part of the paper that we are going to look at is right at the end of the paper, because this is where it's put, and that is the references, which I think is always the most important part of any paper. So our first reference here is from E.T. Whitaker, and it is A History of the Theories of Ether and Electricity from 1910. Then it is from James Clerk Maxwell on the lines of force from 1861. Then from W. Thomas or Lord Calvin by the sounds of it. And that's a Pinus atomized, I think. And that's from 1902. It's very interesting how the first three references here are from a long time ago. These first three references are all from over a hundred years ago. Now that's not to say that they're wrong. However, it's going to be very interesting the references that he chooses to use from more recent times compared to the references that he uses from a long time ago. So the fourth reference that is used here is from Frederick David Toome, and that is the double helix theory of the magnetic field from 2006. And the fifth reference is from Frederick David Toome, and that is Maxwell's equations extended to gravity from 2017. So he is using things from the last 20 years. However, let me just check the top of the paper again. Oh! Fre Frederick David Toome is the person that wrote this paper. So the modern references that he is using are his own references. Although I suppose I'm being a little bit unfair because the sixth reference here is from M. Sahoni and that's not Frederick David Toome, at least I hope not. And that's from 1990. 
But if we go to the page, the mass energy equivalence deception, the second greatest in 20th century physics. So they're basically just denying modern findings here. And if we go down to the bottom of the page, here's a funny thing. <laughs> it uses Comic Sans. This is, this is hilarious to me. Now, as for reference number seven, they've got Australian engineer Ian Montgomery proposed that a sea of electron-positron couplets fills the law space. Nice stuff. However, they don't tell you where he said this. They do say full details were never published, but that's not an excuse for not saying where they've said this. In reference number eight, we have a very similar case to reference number seven. Although I suppose they do link the email, which is, I guess, better than nothing? Now, as for reference number nine from Dr. Alan Rothworth, an Aether model of the universe, this is probably one of the best references in here. However, it doesn't appear to be in an actual peer-reviewed journal. The only sites that I can find this paper on are archive sites. Maybe it is in a peer-reviewed journal, but I can't find it in a peer-reviewed journal. Now, as for reference number 10, you may not have heard of this person, but I have. And he's actually someone that I do plan on making a debunk video on. And that is Ray Fleming from 2017. In fact, I think this is published in, oh, yep, <laughs> the General Science Journal. The greatest journal to ever exist because it allows pseudoscientists to publish things. Next, we've got John C. Polasek, Dual Space, and if we go to the Amazon link, it says, get ready for a brand new dimension in space physics. The author proves with simple arguments that there is a second universe. <laughs> that is quite funny to me. Um, apparently there is a second universe. I wonder if there's a third universe. Did they manage to prove that too? And last reference, reference number 12, is from Who Franklin, and it's called The Real God Particle. Now, if we take just a quick look at that paper, one of the funny things is that it only has four references. I don't think this ever got published in a peer-reviewed journal. I'd be surprised if it did. Especially considering that the first reference is a frequently asked questions page, the second reference is Wikipedia, and the fourth reference is his own website. So needless to say that the references that are in the paper that we're looking at aren't that great. And the ones that do seem at least somewhat valid are from ages ago. So now that we've seen what references it uses, let's take a look at the actual paper itself. If you exclude the references, the paper is only three pages long, which is pretty short for a paper, to be honest. It starts out with Bernoulli's Sea of Aether Whirlpools. E.T. Whitaker writes, all space, according to the young John Bernoulli, is permeated by a fluid aether containing an immense number of excessively small whirlpools. The elasticity which the aether appears to possess, and in virtue of which it is able to transmit vibrations, is rarely due to the presence of these whirlpools, for, owing to centrifugal force, each whirlpool is continually striving to dilate and so presses against the neighbouring whirlpools. So yes, John Bernoulli did publish a paper on the aether. The problem is that it had no experimental support whatsoever. In science, you always want to have experimental evidence, because if you don't have any experimental evidence, then, well, a claim without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. The important thing to note is that the aether alone is not sufficient to explain electromagnetism. We need a sea of aether whirlpools. James Clerk Maxwell expanded on Bernoulli's idea in his 1861 paper on physical lines of force. Maxwell makes no mention of Bernoulli, but he pointed out in part two of this paper that no such arrangement could be possible unless there were idle wheels between the vortices. Maxwell linked these idle wheels with the particles of electric current, hence Maxwell's sea of whirlpools became a sea of electric particles. In Apinus Atomized, Lord Kelvin said, My suggestion is that the Apinus fluids consist of exceedingly minute equal and singular atoms, which I call electrions much smaller than the atoms of ponderable matter, and they permeate freely through the spaces occupied by these greater atoms, and also freely through space not occupied by them. So one of the things that people need to realize about Maxwell is he actually had some criticisms of the ether. 
Aethers were invented for the planets to swim in, to constitute electric atmospheres and magnetic fluvia, to convey sensations from one part of the bodies to another, and so on, until all space had been filled three or four times over with aethers. The only aether which has survived is that which was invented by Huygens to explain the propagation of light. So yes, whilst Maxwell did have ideas for the aether, he was also critical of those ideas as well. As for the Lord Kelvin quote, it seems like he was just saying, hey, here's an idea of how things might work. And he never said that this is definitely how things work. Otherwise, he probably would have used stronger language than, my suggestion is, and going on to say what he said. It was suggested in the double helix theory of the magnetic field that Maxwell's idle wheels are aether sinks, electrons, and aether sources, positrons, such that each individual tiny vortex constitutes a dipole in which an electron and a positron are in a state of mutual circular orbit. Aether will emerge from positrons and sink into neighbouring electrons, and so the aether in the universe will be continually renewing itself. The rotation of a single dipole will induce vorticity in the aether, hence leading to a dipolar aetherial vortex being contained within it. These dipoles will mutually align solenoidally in a twisted rope ladder fashion, with the electrons angularly phased above and below the positrons in the axial plane, giving rise to helical springs which constitute magnetic lines of force. See figure 1 below. So there is a huge problem that I can see with that, and that is positrons and electrons, when they get too close, they tend to annihilate each other. Now they do suggest that electrons and positrons are mutually orbiting each other, however that doesn't stop them from crashing into other electrons and positrons. And the thing is, with electrons and positrons, they tend to want to come together because they're opposite charges. And that will make them annihilate each other. And another problem is, when it comes to the ether, where does it come from and where does it go? Funnily enough, there is probably an answer to this, but it's more of a Ken Wheeler answer than a legitimate answer, and that is counterspace. So yes, now your counterspace can produce word salad and ether. It's a great two for one deal. But anyway, with this double helix theory, and it's not a theory, let's just call it what it is, a hypothesis. It hasn't been tested and it hasn't been confirmed. And it's based on science that was disproven years ago. It just has so many issues with it. Like, what even causes it to align itself in a double helix fashion? Why is it looking like DNA? The paper then goes on to state, It is a common mistake to try and explain both gravity and electromagnetism using a single medium. And this is where I think, you know, if you just accepted the standard model of physics, your problem would be solved. Because with the standard model, you've got four fundamental forces, and gravity and electromagnetism are two separate ones. Now when it comes to the rest of this paper, there's nothing that I find particularly interesting about anything else, except for one bit here, where it says, The idea that space is densely packed with electrons and positrons has been suggested by a number of people over the years. See references! 6 through 12. It really does make it seem as though these references are just afterthoughts, you know? If your reference isn't over 100 years old, or if you're not Frederick Toome, then your reference is just an afterthought, you know? Ian Montgomery is an afterthought. Arden Barker, afterthought. Ray Fleming, an afterthought. So to sum up that paper, some of the ideas, they wouldn't actually work. The ideas presented in the paper relied on things that have been long discarded in science, such as the ether. The references are terrible and mostly treated as an afterthought. The problems that the paper is trying to solve can easily just be solved with the standard model. And there's no actual evidence to actually back up the things that are being said in the paper. So my final rating out of 10 for this paper will be... Where did it come from? Where did it go? Where did it come from? Counter space out of 10. But one good thing I can say about this paper is that there are worse ones out there. So make sure you leave a like and subscribe and leave a comment letting me know that that is something that you'd like to see. As always, a big shout out to my $20 or more patrons. Hugh Jars, MC Nutkin, Shaki, Wolfie, Mori, Graymore Ghost, Kid Vicious and Sarcha Campbell. If you want to support me financially, you can do so on Patreon. There should be a link there. But anyway, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me, thank you for watching.